Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Facebook Live sessions. I'm sorry that we missed you all last week. We had a little bit of a scheduling conflict and had to reschedule for today. So we are here um, and excited to, to have you all back. I know that everyone is kind of ending their summer vacations and plans and hopefully starting to get ready for the school year, um, which is always exciting, if not also nerve wracking at the same time. So thank you for joining in. If you are not watching this live and you are joining us at a later time, you're more than welcome to still drop comments below as normal. Um, and we'll get to those later, but you will be able to watch this on Facebook even after the Facebook Live is over. So don't worry if you can't be with us at this time. Um, today we have Dr. Jonathan Hoffman with us. Uh, we're very excited to talk to him. We have a new topic that we've not discussed before. Um, and so Dr. Hoffman is a licensed psychologist in Florida, New York, and Utah, and board certified in behavioral and cognitive psychology. Dr. Hoffman is the chief clinical officer and co-founder at the Neurobehavioral Institute, or MBI, if you've seen that around, and co-founder of the MBI Ranch Residential Program. Dr. Hoffman is on the Scientific and Clinical Advisory Board of the International OCD Foundation and a co-chair of its special interest group on OCD and autism spectrum disorder, and has served as a faculty member of the Behavior Therapy Training Institute, or BTTI. Among other publications, he's the author of Stuck Understanding Asperger's Syndrome and Obsessive Compulsive Behaviors. Um, and at the end of this, I'll drop a link for the book and the comments just in case anybody wants to check that out, as well as a link to uh, the NBI Ranch and the NBI website so that you guys can just click on that. Um, and today he is going to give us a short presentation um, about cognitive behavioral therapy, which is CBT. We've gotten some emails in the past about this. Uh, we've heard people mention it and people talk about their experience with it. And so we thought it would be good to bring this as a Facebook Live topic so that we can get a little better understanding of what CBT is and how it is um, used in conjunction with um, helping with NBLD and nonverbal learning disability. So he's gonna give us a short presentation and introduce us to CBT and kind of its uh, different methodologies and that kind of stuff. And then as always, you are more than welcome to drop comments or questions or anything in the comment section below, as long as it's related to the topic today. And then we will try to answer those at the end. Like I said earlier, if you're not joining us live, feel free to drop those comments in even at a later time and we will try to get answers to that as well. So I'm gonna turn this over to you, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. All right. So he's going to share a screen so that we can see a presentation. And I'm going to mute myself. So hi, everybody. I'm, I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to introduce, uh, as Samantha said, everybody to cognitive behavioral therapy. I was introduced to cognitive therapy, uh, I have to say, decades ago, and it's really, it was really eye-opening for me because it's such a different way of looking, not only at um, how to uh, help people with different um, sorts of life challenges or different psychological conditions, but it's kind of like a, a personal philosophy of living as well that I think is kind of a great framework for um, making changes and just kind of you know, experiencing life in a con as constructive way as, as possible. So today, um, again, is said that I, I'm gonna just provide sort of like some introductory um, uh, ideas about the concepts and principles of CBT, and uh, then conclude with talking about some um, application to NVLD. And I'm really excited to talk about NVLD because I think we don't really uh, talk about this topic enough. I don't think people are as aware of, of this uh, condition as they, as they need to be. They think it's much rarer than it is, or, or sometimes it's not really discussed. Well, how would you really tailor CBT for this, the needs of this particular population? So um, that's, uh, I guess that's the start of things. So I wanna um, just, as the slide says, go over the basics. So CBT is really interesting because even though it has kind of a modern form, you know, over like, you know, starting really not all that long ago, again, just kind of back uh, you know, X number of decades in, in, uh, in the world, it really has ancient roots. 
Um, part of CBT is rooted in kind of stoic philosophy from the West. And more recently, it's, it's expanded its, its idea of its roots to Eastern philosophy as well. CBT is always evolving. So when people say they know CBT, you know, it's CBT and which wave? The first CBT uh, wave was really about um, really kind of uh, conditioning, Pavlovian conditioning, um, conditioning that's called operant conditioning, which is about how we learn from rewards and punishment, or we learn in us from social uh, social learning uh, experiences. But as it's evolved, um, it just went from strictly behavioral to, as the name says, to being cognitive, saying, well, you know, maybe if the situation is important in altering the situation, but it's also how we think about and process the situation. Uh, and then the next wave was kind of, east, I, I wrote it as East meets West, where you know you can do a lot of things in terms of behavior modification or understanding processes, but you kind of need a life philosophy. So that was you know as I'll speak about, it started to incorporate Eastern ideas like mindfulness, meditation, and a whole lot of uh, Eastern philosophies regarding, especially of acceptance. Um, the, a fourth wave may be coming, which is taking all of that and connecting it to um, recent. Uh, learning about the brain. So we want to connect CBT always with neuroscience ultimately, because all of these things, philosophy, uh, behaviorism, uh, just the way we live, individual differences, they all are, need to be kind of put into the framework of CBT. Uh, specifically, CBT examines and challenges uh, uh, the perceived links between behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. Now, I say perceived because sometimes we think well, they, they, these things all go together, but sometimes it's really important to know they don't. You can think a certain way and feel a different way, and you can think and feel one way and behave in a totally different way. I mean, we could all imagine from our own lives that sometimes we're really angry and that we're, or we're thinking or taking you know, offense to something, but we can still behave in a constructive way. So as part of CBT is helping us understand the difference between uh, thoughts, uh, behaviors, and feelings. Their similarities, their overlap, but also their important differences and the importance of differentiating them. Within CBT, we talk about uh, core beliefs, things we learned in childhood, ways of understanding the world that we learned from our families and early experiences. We talk about um, unhelpful, unhelpful present assumptions like, oh, this isn't going to work out, or oh, I, can, I can't do this, I'm unworthy. And then just kind of those things that pop into our, all of our minds, these what, what in CBT we call negative automatic thoughts, like uh, I can't deal with this, or this is too much for me. And within this um, area, we also can kind of talk about cognitive errors. Everybody makes kind of mistakes in thinking. So we should never take our thinking all that seriously. We think this cause, effect, cause and effect when it doesn't exist. We take things personally when it's, when it's really comments about our behavior, not about us as human beings. We make mountains out of molehills and molehills mole hill, mole out of mountains. We think in very all or nothing ways like, oh, nothing will ever work out rather than, hey, just this thing didn't work out. We jump to conclusions, we overgeneralize. You know, it's like a list of cognitive, I don't wanna call them sins because there's no moral dimension to it. It's just things we do, but being aware of it can help us learn how to correct it. And in order to correct it, sometimes we use this, we use different models and the one that you know is maybe um, most easy to explain is the ABCD model. It has an E and an F too, but we'll stick with this where it kind of looks at, well, A, what is kind of the situation we're in? Uh, maybe someone is late and doesn't show up at uh, a place for us. And then we look at C, oh, we're angry about that. But the situation really didn't make us angry. It's the fact we think and, and have a rule that people should be on time that's making us angry. So by understanding this and using D, um, disputing these connections, we can come at a more like reasonable thing, maybe make ourselves a little less angry by saying, hey, I really like people who arrive on time, but there's no really hard and fast rule they have to. It's a preference. And each kind of psychological um, condition or experience that bothers us or creates a challenge for us has a kind of similar mechanics, whether it's depression about negative, overly negative thinking about ourselves, the situation, the future, and, or anxiety, they all have this kind of model. And understanding, understanding this model and how to challenge it is an, is an essential element of CBT. One uh, difference between CBT and a lot of other kinds of therapies, and one of the reasons that it attracted me, was that it's, it's very, very highly uh, amenable to researching. It has a very, very strong evidence base, which is always expanding. And it doesn't kind of, it, although it takes into consideration the past, 
it doesn't get us mired in the past. It's like, how did everything that we've experienced and everything we believe, how is it, and everything that's causing a problem for us, how is that impacting us right now in the present? And that's the focus. And while CBT is this overarching framework, it also takes into account the fact that no two things are alike, no two people are alike, no two, just like no two snowflakes are alike. We have to personalize um, our individual uh, plan for, for, for any given person with CBT, however, in this overall framework. So it provides a very nice way of dealing with both the way people in general are and the way a specific person or a specific family or a specific situation is. So CBT has lots of different techniques or methodologies, which um, are kind of like the tools in your toolbox. Cognitive restructuring is like kind of that, that A, B, C, D model, where you take the kind of thought you're having, but you, you, know, you don't make your thought like the be all and end all. You say, well, maybe I could look at it in a different way. I could reframe it. I could say, hey, you know what? The person was late, but you know what? Maybe I, that gives me a little extra time to catch up on things. And you know, if you're really upset, you could say, and, and, and blaming the person, you could say, well, maybe, they, maybe something happened to them, or maybe they just forgot. You know, people, we're just human beings. So cognitive restructuring is really kind of reframing and looking at things in different ways. Uh, behavior therapy is kind of, how do we change our behavior through understanding the contingencies? You know, we do certain things because they're habit or because they've been rewarded or not rewarded or because they've been punished in the past. And how can we look at those and understand those things so we're not kind of prisoners of past learning histories? Uh, behavioral activation, which is most familiar with use with depression, means that when we feel a certain way like depressed, we kind of, maybe we take to our beds or we don't do things. So we deprive ourselves of, of having opportunities to get uh, reinforcement, to have some pleasure to do things. So behavioral activation does what CBT always advocates, which is everything follows behavioral change. So if you start behaving in a non-depressed way, your feelings might well catch up to that. Um, a lot of the work I do with OCD and related conditions pertains to what's called exposure-based therapy, sometimes called exposure and response prevention. And the model here really is very interesting. Um, most people want to feel comfortable or feel safe, but it turns out that sometimes, I mean, that's important in life, but sometimes it can work against us. For example, if you have anxiety and don't go out and, you feel, and your safe place is lying up, is being under the covers, well, that's not being really helpful. Now, you may be afraid to go into the world either for OCD reason or social anxiety or a phobia or whatever reason, the reason is. But when you start to challenge this, you're gonna feel uncomfortable, the opposite of comfort at first, but over time, you're gonna learn how to deal with things in a much more constructive way. All the evidence is, is supportive that exposure-based therapies are highly effective in managing a whole variety of issues, especially the anxiety and obsessive compulsive ones, but lots of things in general. DBT actually is one of those um, modalities that, that is used a lot for emotional regulation, but for many of the other issues as well. But it, that's the one that really, um, I think we talk about a lot for the, the, where East meets West, where strategies of change kind of coexist or are dialectical with strategies of acceptance. And DBT teaches a whole toolbox about how to, how to keep oneself emotionally re regulated in stimuli that would usually trigger emotional dysregulation. So it's very, very useful. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy is a modality in which all of the things that we do are put in a context of values and our goals. So even though we might feel like yelling at somebody or withdrawing from a situation or giving up, if our values, we commit to the idea that our value is to succeed in a given task, we try to make all our actions congruent or, or compatible with our goals rather than our feelings. Mindfulness, another kind of Eastern thing, mindful meditation being an example, where we try to become more observers than reactors to our own internal process. One of the biggest things that's talked about, I'm just going back to ACT for a second, is experiential tolerance. And that's true of a lot of these techniques, that instead of treating our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations as something that we should control or suppress or try to run away from, it's an embracing of that. They're out of our control anyway. The only, you know, who knows what we really can control, but we certainly can't control our thoughts and our feelings, they just happen. What we can control is our value-based and goal-based behavior. Um, stress management uh, is very important. We're living in stressful times, especially in our, our up and down COVID world right now. And maybe it's a good thing to have some ideas about how to reduce muscle tension through progressive muscle relaxation, 
uh, understand what stress is. A formula that I love is that is stress equals pressure minus the ability to adapt, which implies you can manage, you can go on a vacation and reduce pressure, but you can't do that for everything. So the real key to stress management is, in, is improve your adaptability, your ability to kind of cope with things. Uh, and that actually, because what does stress mean? It means something's happening that we feel like we have to adjust to. And the social skills training is just one of many, many specific uh, modalities that CBT offers in order to improve functioning in a, in a given area. So CBT, as I mentioned, is, is a highly uh, research supported. It's supported for anxiety and, and uh, all the anxiety conditions. It has an, uh, um, and for obsessive compulsive disorder. I mentioned behavioral activation for depression. Uh, there is trauma informed and trauma focused therapy. You know, people can go through horrible uh, times in their lives and have very unusual experiences, which keeps them stuck. And CBT has some tools to help people get unstuck with their lives and learn to um, deal with the inevitable effects of trauma, but not let trauma stop them from moving on with their lives as much as possible. As I mentioned, it's very, uh, it's very effective for, uh, for dealing uh, with stress, for thinking about stress in a different way, for reducing stress. CBT is also very helpful for relationship problems. A lot of relationship problems go back to that idea is about how we, if someone says something we don't like, we usually we have this idea, well, they shouldn't say things we don't like, but who wrote that rule, you know? Um, we can, we can reevaluate a lot of the things and not maybe take things so personally, or we could find ways if we react less to be more constructive in relationship. A very important uh, tool in dealing with relationships, of course, is, is not to assume bad intentions from other people. Sometimes something does something to us and we think it's because they're bad people or they're out to get us, and maybe they just said the wrong thing. So just assuming, you know, assuming good intentions, and it's not always true, obviously, but most of the time it's true. And it, that's just one of those concepts that CBT really emphasize. Again, CBT is helpful for, you know, most psychological conditions. Uh, that is not the only thing that's helpful for them, but, but it, it's, it, it's an important modality for many of these things to learn how to eat in a, in a healthier way, to deal with specific eating disorders like anorexia or bulimia or, or binge eating, and also uh, what is called disordered eating. Some people eat in certain patterns and certain, according to certain textures, they will be, eat very selectively, things like that. CBT has, uh, has different sorts of protocols to deal with all of these things. Same for substance abuse. And, and to get us to the heart of our matter today, with learning disabilities, um, CBT can very, be very effective in one, helping people um, organize themselves or, or learn in a more effective way per se, or dealing with the emotional effects of having a learning disability. All of these things interact with one another. So, which brings us to what is the application of CBT to NVLD? Well, we know that NVLD is a very challenging condition for all concerned, the people who have it, their family members, and it is uh, associated with certain mental health challenges and certain conditions. Um, anxiety is, um, you know, is very, um, is found um, at, quite often among people in NVLD. Uh, depression, emotional dysregulation, you know, part of the, uh, NDLD is associated with some social issues, and it's very frustrating to not be able to decode the world uh, socially, um, and that can lead to a lot of frustration, anger, withdrawal, and all of, uh, and all of these mental health issues. Um, one of the applications of CBT to NDLD specifically is to increase one's ability to deal with those, tr those triggers of anxiety. So that whereas you used to like say, well, I'm feeling anxious to something I don't like, so I'm gonna give up or I'm not gonna deal with it or I'm gonna get frustrated. And now CBT can help people and improve their ability to stay in situations so they have opportunity to learn. And one of the most important things in any kind of learning disability, whether it's for reading or social learning um, kind of disability is the staying in a situation so there's opportunity to learn and improve functioning. Um, a lot of times people with NDLD go through critical life events, including uh, traumas, like anybody else, they have family issues, they may have struggle in school or the workplace. But again, the whole idea about CBT is how can you increase your ability to deal with whatever life is kind of throwing at you? The ultimate goal here is to build a sense of self-efficacy, a sense of true confidence, not confidence where you say, oh, I can do anything, because that's kind of like 
false or pseudo confidence, but the confidence that, that I can learn the skills to deal with anything that life has to offer. And even if I can't, I have the confidence to accept that. And with that being said, um, I know we're going to now talk about this subject, and I hope that provides some sort of basic introduction to, to our, our topic. Awesome. Thank you. That was really good. I like the way it was broken down. Um, and then at the end, just how it applies to NBLD. And so one thing I want to kind of talk about to start, I have a couple of things I, I want to go over. Um, so whenever we talk about CBT with NBLD, we're not we're not talking about, and, and I say this with air quotes because you don't everyone has a different perspective, but you don't treat NVLD. So what CBT is, is it's really focusing on the anxiety that is caused by having NVLD um, that comes with whatever the symptoms are that the person has that, that is related to NVLD, whether it's social skills or academic or spatial or whatever it is that their deficits are in. The CBT is really focusing on the anxiety and the emotional, um, I can't think of the word, the emotional pieces that come from that, correct? Yes, um, the sequel or secondary aspects of NVLD are very important. Those are the mental health issues, the adjustment yes. issues, the life issues are extremely important to address. But I will also mention that CBT can be useful in helping with some of the primary aspects of NVLD, like social comprehension and executive function. Okay, cool. And of course, uh, I do not want to neglect mentioning the most common, which I believe comorbidity of NBLD, which is ADHD, attention yes. deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, and CBT does have uh, much to offer in that realm as well. Yeah, and we hear from a lot of people um, that also struggle with the OCD as well. So having the comorbid comorbidity with NBLD and OCD, which I saw was mentioned in your presentation, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, is very interesting. And so I think, um, I'm going to start with some of my questions. I don't see any questions in our comments yet, but I actually have a couple that I want to do. So I'm going to, my questions are going to come from the standpoint of not knowing much about CBT and have, um, but knowing about NVLD. And so based on all of this information, and I, I've heard of children going and doing CBT therapy from parents that have contacted us as well as from adults who have been through CBT. Um, at what age do you recommend that people start with CBT? Is there an age? Well, I guess it's kind of, let's, uh, maybe we could re really focus the question. Well, it, 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 it's not necessarily at any particular age. It's at the age at which maybe problems become significant and start interfering with functioning. And that can occur at very uh, early ages. One of the cool things about CBT is that it's uh, a group of tools that can be modified across um, developmental stages, uh, cognitive abilities, academic abilities, and also the lifespan. Um, CBT can be put into games and into language that even very young children can learn. I always think, wouldn't it be amazing to learn how to not take things so personally uh, like at, at, at the first, I, I think that's the first thing they should teach you in school. Uh, it would be amazing to have some type of emotional education just at the beginning, you know, of those things. Uh, so but that's my, that's my dream and fantasy. But yeah, CBT, yes, can, can be done at a very early age. So um, age is not necessarily a barrier. And if someone's too young for CBT types of techniques, teaching the parents CBT so they can have a CBT kind of framework for raising a child is also something uh, very uh, useful as well. That's interesting. That's a great point. I like that parents could learn it to implement at home and start teaching their child certain things well, and situations. Yeah. And, everything I, and Yeah, I mean, parents take their kids' behavior kind of personally too, or often with NVLD, they would think it's, well, you're being lazy or you're not trying when it's about something else, learning to look at it in different ways. And it's yes. also sometimes no one expects to have uh, some, a, a child with NVLD. It's looking at your own feelings about that and maybe, as I said, restructuring them in a way that's most constructive. Yeah, awesome. And so that goes back to the, we get this comment all the time and we get this email and question and phone call and it's just constant like, I'm an adult with NVLD and no one can help me. And 
we're always hearing from adults that there's nothing out there for them, which we totally understand because a lot of the research is based on children just because of brain development and what research um, is looking at and requiring as far as our proposal into the DSM. And so I think this is great for the adults that are watching or mm -hmm. hopefully tuning in later, because this is one thing that you, that adults can use and, um, you know, find a CBT therapist that can help them with these skills. And we do get so much of the mental health um, things when we hear from people, my child's depressed, or I'm depressed, or I have anxiety, or I have social anxiety, whatever it is. And so we do get a lot of that. And I think this is such a good topic for those people to kind of to take in as well. So I really hope that everyone tunes in and watches that. So this is for all ages. This is life for, 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 for all ages. And you know, it, it was interesting when you said nobody can help me. That's one of those all or nothing ideas. Well, <laughs> no one, that's a pretty strong statement. Maybe yeah. many people have trouble, don't really know about or understand enough about NVLD, but people, there are people who do. Are. And let's distinguish between what research focuses on and what clinicians can offer people based on even research with kids or just based upon uh, empirical research is one thing, but clinical principles and methodologies are another thing. So even if there's research lacking in one area, people can ad adapt the CBT methodology and kind of uh, parlay some of the research findings with children in into, um, into adult populations. Of course. So that actually leads me to two other questions. Um, the first question, because I know I'll forget this one first. So the first question is, if, a, if someone has a therapist that does offer CBT, but they are not familiar with NVLD, is that a problem or is that something that the therapist should be able to help them with given the information that maybe the, um, the patient is giving the therapist? Does that make sense? So like if you have a therapist that's familiar with CBT but not NVLD, is that a problem and can it be fixed? Well, uh, the answer in psychology, we always say is it depends. Okay. Um, if, the th if, if the therapist says, oh, I don't know much about this. I'm going to take a course in it. I'm going to learn about it. Fantastic. You know, of course, finding someone who has experience in it might be preferable. That's not always available. You know, we see this a lot in um, do people know OCD and know autism? People know lots of times people know one or the other, but not both. But oftentimes you can find practitioners who have a great body of general knowledge, and then they can learn specific information about NVLD. That can, uh, that can uh, be, be useful in working with a given person. I think the important thing is that uh, CBT needs to be, as I said, it's a group of general principles, but it needs to be modified to the individual. For example, uh, understanding that people with, um, with NVLD might have trouble learning in certain modalities you know, learning visually or learning in certain ways is very important because therapy ultimately is a teaching, is a teaching uh, experience. So yeah. if you're teaching someone, like for example, if someone has, has dyslexia and you're giving them readings or doing, you know, therapy through readings, it's not a great idea. But if you don't know they have dyslexia or, they, or you don't know they have another kind of reading issue, um, that could be a problem. So I think, it's, I think it's important for therapists to be informed, but also to be able to self-advocate and help, help the therapist understand what you're going through. And you know, I know a lot of these things have st st uh, stigma or people feel embarrassed to bring up things, but I think it's really important to have, to be vulnerable and be open in that situation. So, because it's there for you, you'll get, you know, you get out of, you, to get the most out of it, everybody needs to be on the same page of understanding what's gonna help you and what information is necessary to do that and, yeah. and tool. The more you're willing to share with them at the beginning, the more they're able to kind of like tailor that therapy to your needs. Or, or say, hey, I don't do this, but I know someone who does and give you the appropriate referral. Perfect. So then that actually is a perfect segue into my second question. How can people find therapists that um, is practice CBT? I don't, that probably isn't the right word, but that offer CBT. Is there a, a good source for that? Yeah, um, there, there uh, is a list. I mean, it's not recommendations, but the Association for um, Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies is the largest group of uh, CBT people in the world, I think. And they have a, a referral um, list. So you can just kind of put in your zip code and all of that kind of stuff and find some names and then interviewing people and speaking with them. And uh, 
or reading about them and understanding if they'd be the right person for you is one way to do it. Another thing is to, to do is to, uh, this, the, uh, this is one possible use of the, of the internet. You can just Google CBT in your area uh, for NBLD and see who pops up. I will say that one issue is, um, unfortunately, people kind of say they do CBT sometimes, but they're actually not doing CBT per se, because, you know, talk therapy, it sounds like we're, we're, we're talking and there's nothing, you know, my, that's not against talk therapy or anything, but it's not necessarily synonymous with CBT, which is, has a, a different set of sometimes of principles and, and tools and structure that, that it can, it's, it's sometimes hard to distinguish because someone say, well, we're talking about your thoughts, we're talking about your behaviors, because what therapist wouldn't, but it may not be in a very specific uh, empirically supported CBT format. It's important to really establish that. Okay. And so you said that's the association for CBT. For, 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 yeah, for cognitive, and, uh, ABCT, uh, Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies is a great place okay. to start. Got it. And then what you said just a minute ago is actually going to kind of segue into my next question where this is perfect. So I was thinking during this session, so talk therapy is kind of something that's ongoing for people. It's something mm -hmm. that uh, you do like once a week or once a month, and it's kind of over the span of your lifetime and you're dealing with different issues Maybe. throughout that. Is CBT something that should be or is an ongoing therapy throughout life? Or is this something where if you're struggling with one situation that you can go to therapy, get the skills and the coping mechanisms and the uh, behavioral changes and all that kind of stuff that comes with CBT and then you kind of take that and walk away from it or is it ongoing on a constant well, I'm going to say it again it depends <laughs> sometimes CBT is offered in a very structured time limit format and that's usually for very very specific issues it can be offered like 10 weeks to you know manage x y or z or learn this skill sometimes you know people come and go from therapy they're working on one issue and maybe they need some support or some boosters at another time. So it's kind of like we do it, don't do it, do it. And sometimes uh, people uh, do need have very severe complex issues where they're best supported over protracted periods of time. And sometimes the uh, therapy is best offered in an intensive or accelerated way where you can make more progress with not just once a week or once a month, but, but an intense period, like, like learning a language. How would it be best to learn a language? They should you learn once a week, learn on tape, go move to a country for a little while? It depends. It depends on what your goals are and what the how how relevant it is for you to learn that language. If it's survival, if you're not going, if the the, the, the issue is like, hey, I can't survive without this, then I, I should learn it as quickly as possible. So it's again, it's a it's a CBT is a general idea, general framework but needs to be personalized always to the individual situation and needs, which can vary over time and vary and strongly vary among individuals. Yeah. I think one thing is like, and nowadays people talk about therapy a lot more in mental health. It seems to be less taboo, which I think is great. Um, I think in the past, one of the things that has maybe stopped people from going to therapy is just not knowing what to expect. And so I think these kinds of questions, as far as like the last few that we've talked about how long, you know, what types of therapy, like how long will it last? Is this ongoing? I think it's just good for people to really understand the differences and what they're, what they can expect once they go in. Um, Cause I think just knowing a little more information and having that knowledge is so key when you're going into therapy, because it is, it can be scary and it can be intimidating, especially if you've never done it before. And so I think it's just great to have that information as far as what you can expect um, and what it is that you're going in for. I just think that's really good to know. Right, and I think what's, what people who do CBT uh, stress is the, per it's a collaborative process. CBT is not something that someone does to you or you know does with, you know, it's, it's always collaborative. So usually at the beginning of CBT, there's an understanding that this is what you can expect. This is what we do. This is what the likely outcome within this period of time is. This is what we do if this doesn't work out because sometimes, CBT needs to be combined with medicines or other techniques. It's not a, a be all and end all for, for things. I mean, sometimes it's the only thing necessary, but sometimes it's just one of a group. It's the, the, the person doing CBT is just working as part of, part of a team. But this is a collaborative, open process where um, everything should be transparent, open and explained. And I would emphasize that people should not hesitate to ask their therapist anything that comes to their mind, any concerns they have, 
and a good therapist will will uh, be open to answering those things. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the most important things going into CBT is just being willing to be open and transparent and vulnerable so that you are getting, and we talked about this earlier, just getting the most out of it if you're able to share your feelings and thoughts openly without hesitation. Yes, that would be ideal. Sometimes that's going to take a little while to establish rapport and trust. You don't have to do this on day one, <laughs> but it is, it is, definitely, is. It is definitely the ideal uh, relationship. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Let me just glance at the rest of my notes from your presentation. There was something I wanted to ask about. Pull this back up. I wrote down like the abbreviations of the first letters, but then didn't write down the whole word for the methodologies. Um, exposure based therapy. Um, I think you said that's the one that is kind of, did you say that one's the most common with NVLD? No, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how often it's used with NVLD at all, okay. but it is, but it is common, you know, per se, but it, but it would be the therapy that is most likely to be effective with a lot of anxiety conditions and especially with excessive compulsive disorders. Okay. Which of the methodologies would work best with people that are trying to learn social situations, social cues, all of that kind of stuff? Uh, social skills training, executive okay. functioning, um, relationship building skills, those, yeah. those, kinds, those kinds of things. And how does that work? So, for example, you have someone with NVLD that really doesn't pick up on sarcasm, but wants to be able to interact with their friends and their family who are sarcastic and they want to be able to pick up on that so that they're not offended by the things that are said. How would you, I'm just, I just want to go over like one example or one kind of detail. Sure. Uh, like every, work with CBT? Well, like everything else, um, if you practice something, you get that, you generally get better at it. So uh, role-playing, dealing with sarcasm, understanding, differentiating our sarcastic and non-sarcastic uh, comment, learning how to um, you know, ask, you could even inquire, oh, is that sarcasm? Sometimes I have trouble reading and being disclosing. You know, sometimes it's hard for me to tell. Um, I would say maybe it's an advantage being raised in New York. I know we're, we're speaking from New York to New York and tell from my accent, I'm originally from New York. We get lots of practice in dealing with sarcasm, right? But even in New York, there are people who don't pick up on sarc sarcasm or don't like it very much or, and maybe a, a, a understandably so. But I think dealing with something like sarcasm um, facial expressions, all of those things is very, very important. Um, actually, um, that which brings us to technology. You know, just uh, during COVID, especially interacting on screens with everyone, it actually deprives us of, of body cues that we're used to getting. It's harder for people. People have trouble picking up on social cues to begin with. Tech, things like video conferencing makes it even harder. So that's a challenge too. Which I thought was really interesting. So we actually talked to, I think it was three or four of our adult ambassadors, and it may have been not in the middle of COVID, but maybe at the end of last year. And some of them are saying that they've actually enjoyed not quarantine and not COVID itself, but that it's, they feel like it's more of a level playing field because everyone else is like distanced and because they're on a screen and so they feel like other people may understand a little more how hard it is for them to read social cues and body language and all that which i thought was really interesting i i think that i've heard that from many people i think that's really uh, true um for many people who aren't used to communicating like this it is harder just like people who aren't used to texting because you don't pick up on the you know the uh initials the acronyms the you know, what you should capitalize and what you shouldn't, you know, um, it's like, it's always like learning new languages. And now I guess a lot of us are, are finding out that, well, we may know how to deal with things really face to face in person, but it's hard for us to deal in the same way when we're on screens. Yeah, exactly. So like when, when people are, when people with NVLD aren't texting and they're struggling, Sorry, when people that don't have NVLD are texting and they struggle with inferences and sarcasm and all that kind of stuff, the, the ambassadors we were talking to were talking about how that makes them feel like people without NVLD can understand a little better. Yeah, I, th I think that does help. You know, when you, you know, it's hard to understand someone's issues unless you're in their shoes a little bit more too. So exactly. I, think that's, I think that's a very good point. Yeah, awesome. That was, um, that. I just wanted to kind of get into like one specific thing so people could kind of understand 
-hmm. um, you know, like the details of CBT. Um, that is all the questions that I have. It looks like we do have a couple questions from someone that was logged on. We actually kind of touched on these, so I'll probably drop answers in the comments, but we'll, we'll talk about this one. So she wants to know, and we, we talked about a little bit, but maybe there's some examples we can give. Does CBT help with executive functions? CBT that is tailored to help with executive functions does. There are, there are people who have special training in um, ADHD, which is an executive function uh, related condition that can um, really help people organize, plan, um, prioritize, do all the things that they have difficulty uh, doing. Uh, yeah. and, CB, and CBT skills can help a great deal with that. Plus, it can help you, a person persevere through, the, through things when they get frustrated, which is also very important and very associated with EF issues. Yeah. So dealing, I think you mentioned it earlier, like dealing with, I always think of like dealing, you can't control the situation or what someone does, but you can like control how you respond to it. Yeah. I think that's the cent one of the central ideas of CBT that, you know, it's how we deal with situations most of the time, rather than the situations themselves, that really is going to make the difference in our lives. Awesome. And then her other question was, where can we find an experienced CBT? So I'm going to drop a link to the association that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, as well as just Google. It's Google is the greatest thing. You can search right. anything. Um, psychology Today also, I so we we use Psychology Today as a reference. Obviously, we have never talked to all the, the doctors and professionals that are on there, but they they do make it easy to search by area, by profession and stuff but I do know there's a lot of people on that list and I think you kind of have to cull through it and make calls and meet the therapists that are on there but that is it, it's like the google for psychologists I guess I just don't I know guess, I, I think I, you have to pay to be on the list I'm not really sure um but it's it's an option that's out there yes so, so it, it, we can use all these, all of these things, but of course, uh, buyer buyer beware, and it's good to check out people's and check out their credentials and just make sure it's a good fit for yourself. Yeah. Do you know if a lot of therapists are willing to do phone consultations, especially now first before someone goes into an office, that would kind of help you kind of weed through some uh, of the. It depends. It depends on the therapist. Some are. Some would say, "Hey, you know what? The most important thing is that I meet with you, and you know, just answering some. You know, most people answer." You know some general questions but you know what people don't want to do is have say something it's a brief phone call but it turns into a consult and that a lot, that happens a lot and you know yeah. i think you have to just kind of you know that's one way of feeling out who's the right person for you but on the other hand some people who are very very specialized they're going to be more inclined to say well this is something you have to decide if you're serious about and come for a uh, consultation yeah okay awesome so those are all the comments we have right now if we so there it's friday afternoon so we don't have a lot of people logged in right now, but I have a feeling over the weekend, the video will pop mm -hmm. back up and people always email or comment later. If we have anything that we can't answer on our end, we'll be sure to kind of send those over to you if you have a chance to answer some of those. Sure, my and question. I think that's it. Is there anything else that you wanted to touch base on or like closing words or last well, well, advice? Yeah, my, my, my closing words are, you know, uh, that I really uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak about uh, CBT. Um, I, I, it's become so much more well known than you know when I started when I started out in the field. It was a long time ago, and it's become um, probably the most w well known kind of therapy that's uh, being done today, which is great. But there's still a long way to go in helping with mental health stigma and helping with specific populations and how to tailor CBT to people with specific needs, like people with NVLD who may be you know not served as well as they could be uh, in CB with CBT. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we are very grateful to have you on with us today. I love when we get to talk about new topics, um, especially when it gives people options and ideas and, you know, more information, especially for our adult population that feels like there's not much out there. I think this is a good option and I, you know, think it's good information. It's a good place to start. And then from here, if you're someone that thinks that you might be interested in CBT, you know, go in your area, use Google, um, find a therapist and maybe look into this as an option if you are struggling with some of the things we've talked about today in relation to your NBLD. Um, and I think that's it. So 
Thank you all for joining in. If you didn't join us live or if you're just hopping on now, the video will still be available on Facebook. And as always, you can reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, you can also send us an email. All of our information is on the website. I'm also going to link the MBI website in the comments on this video so that you can check that out as well. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you again.